Welcome to Everyday Entrepreneurs Everywhere with your host, Chris Parker. And welcome back to Everyday Entrepreneurs Everywhere. It's Chris Parker, and I am with Hans Van Damme, who is the, I want to call him the founder and CEO of the Conversation Design Institute. And for those of you outside of, say, the voice and chatbot space, um, conversation design probably means something different than you think. And I will allow Hans to explain that. It's uh, pretty cutting edge stuff. And it's a mix of, of I think, even art and science. I'm delighted to have Hans here on the conversation. Hans, thank you for joining. And can you please share with us what is it that you do and why do you do what you do? Uh, yeah, first of all, thanks for having me, obviously. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, so conversation design is, is an entire new job, actually. It's going to be incredibly important. So what we see is people and artificial intelligence. It's, it's, you know, it's going to play a bigger role in our lives. So you know, people and AI, we need to learn to communicate with each other. And that is really what a conversation designer does for conversational interfaces like chatbots and voice assistants. Uh, it's limited real estate. You're dealing with an interface where people can say and do whatever they want at any given moment. So you need to think about what an AI assistant's going to say and, and how it reacts and how, you know, on one hand, make sure that it understands what people say, but that people also feel understood. And that is really what a conversation designer does. And thinking about it is, you know, if you have an artificial brain, talk to a human brain, then you need to be thinking about the technology, the psychology, and the language. And those three are equally important. And that's really what a conversation designer focuses on. So. And, and for the, I guess, the general audience, um, AI assistant, can you give some, some examples of what that is and, and how people might have been experiencing that in their daily life? Yeah, so one of the, most, the famous ones are obviously Alexa, uh, Siri, Google Assistant. So these are, you know, your, your, your big AI assistants, your voice assistants. But if you go to any enterprise with customer service, you know, every telco uh, utility company, they will have a chatbot on their customer service website, right? Or maybe you reach out by social media to a company on WhatsApp. Those conversations might be automated. So... Mm -hmm. All we see across the board, enterprises are looking to automate about 85% of the conversations that they have with people, uh, employees, customers, uh, can be anyone really. Uh, and so all these conversations need to be designed, need to be deployed, need to be managed. Uh, so what you'll see is that these enterprises are, are setting up these in-house teams of conversation designers. And, and that's where we help them. That's what we help them with kind of. And why conversation design for you, meaning you as a person and an entrepreneur, um, what got you in this space and, and what keeps you there? Because you've been doing this for well, quite a, a few years now. Um, why do you do this? For me, like I always wanted to be a novelist. So I was a writer mm. and I wrote stories in university. Um, and, and, you know, nobody was interested in my, in my fiction. So I became a copywriter and I ended up writing copy uh, at a startup incubator in Amsterdam. Uh, it was very interesting. I learned a ton, a ton of stuff there. Um, then I have my own little startup that I got fired from. So I, I just got a job in customer service. So I was on social media answering questions of people that, you know, were traveling around the world for an airliner and, they had lost their bags in Singapore, but they were already in New York again. And then I would go into these systems and, and find the luggage. Um, but then you would see these, these conversations be automated more. And that was interesting to me because I figured, you know, I might be able to figure this out now because I know how to write dialogues. Uh, I understand the technology and, you know, I now understand the service space, the customer service space. So for me, it was like, I'm probably one of the few people in the world that could have started this company. Uh, and, and that's what got me started. And initially it was just about chatbots and voice assistants. And I, my partner uh, had a background in behavior design. So he had lots of understanding of, of the human mind where I understood the artificial mind more. Um, and that's what, you know, became our company. And first it was just like, let's automate, you know, let's create a good chatbot. Now it's become more about, you know, advancing trust and communication and security between people and AI instead of having that bigger picture 
out there is what keeps us excited every day to go out there and, and educate people on conversation design. And who are you educating? I mean, in, in my, my typical question at this point is who's your customer? Um, and I think you have, knowing your business a bit, you have different types of customers, um, meaning individuals as well as com- companies. Who, who are you educating? Yeah, there's, there's different people, all walks of life end up in conversation design. So on one hand, we have students, just, you know, freelancers or graduates that are actually thinking about, you know, what's my career going to be, right? And for them, conversation design is actually, you know, a very good career opportunity now. I think it's probably one of the easiest way if you're looking to really level up in life, uh, you can become a doctor or a lawyer or a backend engineer. Or you can become a conversation designer and as a non-engineer sit at the heart of AI, which is really exciting. So you still see individuals onboarding uh, as students. Uh, and we have these enterprises that are, you know, have invested in, in technology that allows them to have these conversations. Uh, they want to build these teams. So we go in and we, we train the people that are already working there. So sometimes they have a team that's just not performing well enough or we help them source people within their organizations that could potentially become conversation designers. Mm. And, and we sort of see there's three roles. There's the AI trainer. That's the person that really thinks about, you know, uh, turning data into understanding pretty much the most technical of the three roles that we certify on. These are often people, it's like light data science, overqualified customer service people. Uh, that's usually the people that, that end up there, the conversation designer, itself it's more related to ux design turning knowledge into a conversational flow so what's the structure of the conversation uh these are content managers content writers ux designers that end up in those roles uh and then there's conversational copywriters even that really turn words into dialogue that think about tone of voice that think about the psychology these are our screenwriters these are our expert copywriters uh, often a bit more senior, but really linguists that mm-hmm. really understand words uh, and how to talk and how communication works. So you sort of see like the different roles in a team with different people with different backgrounds ending up in those roles. And I'm guessing the, you know, if the target for some companies is 85% of their, you know, customer interaction, particularly in support, I suppose, um, and, and even, even pre-sales perhaps, onboarding training, there's lots of, uh, you know, use cases there. Um, these, these interactions need to improve. I, like oftentimes when I'm finding myself chatting with a machine, my frustration level goes high. Um, recently with bull.com, um, the wrong product was sent. Okay. And there was no, there was no option anywhere for wrong product. Like there was, there was all sorts of options for choose the product that we, that you ordered that you want to talk about. Um, but because it was pre Christmas and I had ordered a number of things and not everything had arrived, I didn't even know which, which product was actually wrong. Yeah. Um, so then I, yeah. So then I, 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 I had to break myself out of, you know, how do I get to a human? Damn it. So, <laughs> so what, what is the, what is the, the value for these organizations over time? Because I, I imagine they're not, you know, they're spending a lot of money, I'm sure to, to try to solve my problem, but, and some problems that are quickly solved fine. And then some problems are, are frustratingly hard to solve. So yeah. how does, I guess, training on this and improving their capability add value for, for the business and their consumer? Yes, I mean, so there's different types of conversations that they have that you have, right? And usually, what companies do, they start with the you know simple FAQs, right? Uh, how do I even order, or, or what are the payment options at a company like this, right? And then uh, once you've had that set up and that's working, that's already going to reduce some costs and it's going to help a lot of people, uh, you know. And then you want to make that a bit more transactional, right? So for mo- if I have if I've ordered one product, how do I return it? Maybe you have to like download a barcode. Chatbot can help with that. And those are, you know, that's like 80% of your use cases maybe already. With a situation like yours, it's, you know, it's just an exception. So mm. we look at when we design, we, we try to focus on the happy path. And then we look at the, we call it long tail design, right? So you want 80% of the people to go through 20% of your conversational paths. And all the complex stuff, uh, you just hand them over to live chat or you hand them over to the website or sometimes they just have to give us a call. Uh, it's okay for a chatbot to say, no, I, don't, I can't help you with this. 
the way to look at it, if you're a restaurant and I want to order a table at eight o'clock for four people, the chatbot should be able to do that. If it's a group of 13 and two of them are in a wheelchair and one has a nut allergy and two of them are vegan, just give us a call. Hmm. Right? It's like there's no need for a chatbot to solve such a complex situation. Uh, so that's also, you know, how do you design the conversations and, and really unlock the potential of your technology? But it's also how do you understand what actually delivers value and what not? And prioritization in a roadmap is very different in conversation design than in regular products because your product managers and product owners don't really know how much work something is. There is situations where uh, a designer might solve the problem in five minutes where an engineer would take two sprints to solve the same problem just because if you're an engineer, everything is an engineering problem, right? So it's educating these enterprises on what the design is, helping them do a better job, but also understanding what needs to be designed and what not. I, I mentioned it's learning. It, it's just a, it's an organizational learning with some strategy wrapped around it. There's, there must yeah. be some branding and customer experience design, meaning do you, know, do you want to be, maybe, maybe I'm being offensive to AI assistants, but do you want to be impersonal like that in some cases? Um, or, or, or is there some cases when people would love that, meaning they don't want to talk to a real human, they, they just want their, their dinner reservation, you know, so, so what's the fastest, easiest way of getting yeah. the, the dinner reservation? So um, wh- where would a, where would an, um, an organization uh, who hasn't yet started down the AI assistant path uh, start with all this, meaning, meaning uh, if they have a call center and, and if they haven't started this yet, um, what, would, what would the considerations be? And also, how could you help them, I guess, is, a, is a, another question. Yeah, so I guess if you, know, if you have a call center, you probably like, you want to automate what you're already having conversations, right? So if you have all your traffic going to the call center, then you can start a chatbot, but if nobody's finding you online already, it's not gonna do much, right? So then you would be looking at, you know, setting up an IVR and automating some of those conversations there. Um, it's it, it, like, there, you can deploy a chatbot very quickly. The technology behind it is a very simple thing. Um, to, you know, if you wanna have your first prototype and, and MVP built. Uh, but the way to do it is really look at, you know, what are the most frequent conversations, right? And every company has logs mm-hmm. of this, you know, what are the pain points? What do we know about the customer journey that is just upsetting and frustrating? Uh, and then within that, finding the little gems. Uh, and there's a couple of approaches then. It's like, am I gonna go broad or am I gonna go narrow? Do I just solve those? three use cases first and really do a very good job there uh, and then move on to the next topics. Um, a mistake that we see a lot of companies make is even in their, they'll deploy a chatbot and they'll say, I'm the chatbot, ask me a question. Well, then you're going to be disappointing a lot of people because you're not going to be able to answer 90% of them, right? So if I would just say, hey, I'm the chatbot and I can answer a question about your invoice, then everything that's not invoice related, there's no expectation with the customer that you're going to be able to answer that right so it's about managing those expectations around it already uh so these are little hacks that you can do if you want to just deploy your first thing and focus on one little topic and really do a good job there uh just understand how you can manage the expectations around it both internally and externally as well uh then that's a good way to get started and and we always recommend keeping it simple and small first see how that goes for you get more stakeholder support internally as well and then you sort of increase scope etc you triggered me with something um okay i have to laugh in that because there's there's someone who i know has listened to every one of these podcasts and he told me the other day that i say the word triggered in every episode (laughs) So, so i just i don't know if that's true but it probably is but but that's how these conversations go is you say something that's triggering and, and I apparently vocalize that. So um, you've been, you triggered me with the, the, I think you said something like the technology is very easy. And, and by, is that something like um, do that on, on Alexa or use something like Raza to, to do that? What, what would be the, the first baby step well, for the exploration? There, there's even tools that are even simpler like that, right? Where there's the, you know, the, the WordPress for, for chatbots and there's a bunch of those. Uh, where well, you can actually just deploy a simple chatbot really in, in a day. Uh, obviously, you know, if, you, if you're looking to automate 
your customer service department, that's not going to work out for you. But if you want to have your first prototypes and stuff, you, you can just use that and, and don't waste a lot of engineering hours, but just, you know, design a conversation and see how it interacts with people. Uh, then the platforms that we see a lot being used now at the heavier customer service departments, then you're looking at Raza, Microsoft, uh, IBM Watson still a lot. Uh, these are really the frameworks that, that are being used. Dialogflow, particularly in, in the voice space, which is uh, owned by Google. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's different frameworks and then there's more full solution technologies as well. So now you're looking at uh, Amelia, Nuance, uh, LifePerson that really you know, have design interfaces with the, the do the analytics for you that really are a one-stop shop where there's also the open platforms, the, the Raza type technologies that allows you, you know, you have more control, but you also have more responsibility in terms of deployment and engineering, et cetera. Yeah. Can you, can you give us a few words on, on Raza? Cause that's the, an open source solution that, that, you know, I've known you for probably a year plus now and, and Raza comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they also have some training, but more around the technology and the architecture. Um, how, how does Raza fit into this? As an, as an open source um, solution. Yeah. yeah, so so Raza on one hand is open source, they obviously also have enterprise solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, so what Raza is really focusing on, on NLU, so really you know, natural language understanding, understanding what people say, uh, that's what they're really good at. Uh, and it's a young company, it's, it's a, uh, they've raised a ton of money now uh, and they're really finding their position amongst the, you know, the big enterprises. Uh, what they're good at is just understanding better what people say mm. and they're engineering focused. So, uh, you know, if, if you're an open source solution and you have a tech team that, you know, wants to build a chatbot, uh, Raza is easy to find. You, you can deploy it very quickly and start building your first chatbot. Uh, that's why, why it's really good. And they're doing lots of training around it now. Actually, their uh, online courses are going to be moved to uh, conversationdesigninstitute.com. Uh, so, so we're good friends, um, and it's really, you know, it, how do you set up these teams where is it really the engineer that they focused on first that is going to build in these chatbots? Well, then you have the problem if it's, if it's very engineering focused, the technology, then, you know, you need to be a hardcore engineer. That's probably not the person you want to have talk to a million customers every day, hmm. right? So the more engineering focused the platform is, the more need for you know, the bigger the need for conversation designers is to sort of counterbalance that. Whereas you would have a very easy to use full service solution that you could actually have your customer service people work in it. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you, you'd get to that higher quality faster. So that's one of these things where Raza is super powerful, but the learning curve is a bit steeper, a bit steeper for most people. Uh, but it allows you to really focus on, on mission critical journeys very well. So a lot of the, a lot of insurance companies are running on Raza also because it's open source. So you can run it on prem where data security is obviously a big issue around that. And that's one of the key things that they solve as well there. And um, we're going to get to security very, very soon. Uh, Cause that's a, that's a main major issue. I think in this going forward as, as I guess the, the sensitivity of information privacy of information, you know, between the, 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 the AI and the human increases in order to make it more and more valuable. But you did mention friends and, and, and learning curve. So I have also had a conversation with Martin Lenz Fitzgerald and, and you, and you guys really introduced me to the world of voice um, and AI assistance and related as the OVN, the open voice network. And you shared with me a bit ago that um, you're, you're having some sort of an alignment or partnership with that, that your training will also be um, available or, or through the OVN. Can you share a little bit about that agreement? Yeah. Uh, well, what we're looking to do is it's really, you know, OVN is, is trying to create standards for, you know, the voice space and, and the conversational space, which we're trying to do from the design perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. So it makes a ton of sense, you know, to, to team up around that and, and work together. Uh, so, yeah, John is doing a great job at, at really creating this global community of people that are involved in this space. And we're happy to be part of it. And, uh, you know, our expert, we're just, you know, a couple of years in already. So we know how to get these teams built and, and set up and what the capabilities are that companies need. Uh, so we can contribute that to OVN, where obviously OVN has 
tremendous expertise mm-hmm. around, you know, how do you, what does the architecture look like? What are the standards there? Uh, so it's a great fit and I'm happy to be part of it. Yeah, it's a good group. And I'm, I'm part of the architectural team there and, and so impressed with the depth of, of experience these people, um, you know, so some, sometimes I can hold my own, you know, uh, technically and architecturally, but these guys are, are, are deeply experienced for years on AI assistance and, and voice assistance. So it's as far as a, a learning for me, it's, it's just a delight. And uh, I'm, so, I will, I'm sure I'll have some more OVN people on for conversations in the future. So uh, com- coming back to the security, um, you and I worked on uh, an ongoing initiative late last year around security. That's an ongoing uh, uh, process. And, and in the spirit of startups failing fast, we, we, we spent um, quite a bit of time you know, together as a small team validating and not really surprising because of the early nature of this, it didn't pop and go unicorn instantly, you know, because mm-hmm. we ha- had some technology uh, ambitions and then we, and I think we wisely uh, connected to some prospects and customers to validate, and we learned a lot. So can you share, um, without going into that initiative, because that will be you know coming soon to a podcast near you in, in a year or so, <laughs> or, or whenever that is ready to be revealed, um, what did you learn in that time around the need for trust and privacy and security in the world of AI assistance? Because we learned so much in that you know couple of months that we were working very closely together. Yeah, um, what I what I learned. So, so for me, what I'm interested in in general is you know advancing trust, communication, and security between people and AI. And I strongly believe that we need to have security at every conversational touch point. So every time an AI and a human interact, we want to be able to secure uh, that that conversation in a safe environment so that we can manage and audit the data, etc. Um, and when we went out and talking to all these enterprises is that security and data issues are are a top priority, right? And everybody's thinking about it. Everybody's looking at, you know, right, this is a problem. We identified a problem, but I think what we learned is that the problem is much bigger than, than we foresaw initially, where we focus on a specific point in the ecosystem to secure that, you know, to really create the framework for that allows companies to have personalized and transactional conversations in a secure way. But there were so many parts in the ecosystem where security was an issue that the problem that we initially saw was not top of mind yet. So it's like, oh boy, there's another issue there. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. So it tells you on one hand that, you know, it, it's still early stage in the entire default architecture of AI assistance, uh, which is obviously exciting and fun to figure out what should it look like. Uh, It also tells you that with the quick adoption of AI assistance, that there's lots of companies that need to get founded to focus on all those different areas in that data security ecosystem. Um, So I think that that's sort of what we what we learned is that, all right, we need many more people focusing on these issues because there's every customer that you talk to, they had, you know, five to 10 specific security issues that were different than ours, than the one that we were focusing on. Um, so so I, I guess that's, that's what we learned. It's still early stage and there's a lot of work around it and, and it comes from every direction because it's not just, you know, where someone talks to the AI, no, it's every, pretty much every touch point in the back end as well, the back of the house uh, that needs to be secured as well. Yeah, the, 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 and it was also, for me, it was interesting that the types of industries we were speaking to, you know, telecom had different needs than financial services than, than I imagine maybe, maybe uh, medical space, you know, because they were, they were solving different problems, had different ambitions for the types of sensitive information and the level of, of trust. Not only trust that they, you know, not only security that they could, that they could create, but also to the emotional trust with the actual user, because the, the user, you know, imagine you need to give your blood type or, or, or something, you know, something that's, that's very sensitive, you know, you want to be highly confident that you can trust that whole ecosystem. And this is, yeah. uh, this was a, a, an amazing um, and very important, you know, sort of ecosystem that we were working on. 
Uh, just a couple of minutes left, we, and, and I'm just going to ask you uh, a selfish question, because we used the simplicity scan on that initiative, and you talked about using it for Conversation Design Institute. Um, what I use the scan for is, of course, to, to create alignment amongst the, the people on the team. And you never get it right in the first place. And we went through the scan a couple of times on, on that initiative. What's your experience with the simplicity scan? And, and how did you... How did how did you experience that? What what did it do for you? I, I think it, it, you know there's other you could also use like uh, you know the what's the thing called the, this basic startup one that everybody always uses the uh, business model canvas the business model canvas yeah. right what I think what this this you know compared to that it it becomes more personal very quickly uh, and it helps more with the alignment on the team where if you if you sort of you know, if you compare the two, the other one's very much about, oh, there's us, there's just people in this room, and then there's the business, and we want to create that business. And, and it, uh, you know, it's very tempting to just dream big, etc. cetera. But uh, I think the simplicity scan makes it personal, and it makes you, it forces you to immediately think you know, about how do I actually see the world, and, and what is this group of people how does it collectively see the world and, and it identifies those weaknesses and, and challenges there as well. Um, you know, where, where, you know, egos show quickly, I guess, with, with these mm -hmm. things as well. And I think that, that was interesting with, with how we used it. And I remember you saying, it's like, if this part of the simplicity scan does not make sense, there's not even, there's no point to even look at the other stuff, uh, which I think is very, very powerful. So it forces you to think about, you know, your project on, on that personality level very quickly and, and on the realistic resources in, t in terms of time and stuff that you have, how realistic is this? And then it just, it's a great conversation starter. So I would actually recommend every team to sort of just use it and, uh, yeah, the you, learn a lot, you learn a lot quickly. And, and I think the, when people ask, like, you know, advice in general, how do you start a business and what should we, what should you do? And there's always like, if, if you have a lot of shadow, you shouldn't start a business yet, right? You need to be very comfortable with, your, with yourself and you get to know yourself well before you do any other thing. And it's the same, I think the simplicity scan puts you on that path very quickly. Yeah, and, 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 and it worked with us, you know, it got us on the same page and, and being on the same page doesn't mean always agreement, you can also be on the same page about what you do disagree on. It's equally powerful for me. And, and what I uh, really recommend is just do the left side, you know, the focus plus mindset. So if you can just ask your team independently to write down, what's the purpose? Why are we here? What's the impact? You know, who's our customer? What value are they, they going to get? What's our product? How are we going to capture value? What does that customer experience look like? Because that's sometimes different than the, should be different than the actual product. So how are you going to co-create that with the customer? And what is the mindset of the team? Those five questions alone, have people write it down and then share it um, and discuss about what you agree and disagree. And do that every month or every quarter. And then once you, once you get tighter, then you can start looking at the rest of it. Um, because, yeah, you know, and, and I'm, I'm convinced of this. If you can't get those five questions close enough with a the team, then, then the rest of it is going to be fractured. It's going to be going in yeah. different directions. So um, outstanding. And good luck with using it on Conversation Design Institute. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing back from your experience on that. So we are really out of time. I will um, put your LinkedIn, so Hans van Damme, um, your LinkedIn link on the show notes. And of course, people can find you at conversationdesigninstitute.com. Com. Dot com indeed. Yeah. Dot com, so. right on. Yeah. Yeah. Hans, right thanks on. so much. Thank you for having me. It was a great pleasure seeing you guys, sir. Learn more at ebillion.com slash podcast.